I do feel like we're going, we're just about to start a new bear market. The question is, is it a contained bear market like 2022? Or is it like a full on stage four market collapse like 2008 financial crisis or the, the tech bubble burst? I like gold. Gold still looks like it's it's heading higher. It's super conservative. Out of all the plays right now, and I've been saying this for the last like month and a half, is the best, highest probability play is just gold, physical gold. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoff and I'm the JR Mining Guy on Twitter, CEO of the Soar Financial Group, and of course, your host for this channel. And if you can't tell, I'm sweating. It's super warm and humid here in Germany. Personally, I can't wait for summer to be over. It's not my favorite season. I'm more of a fall guy, also because I like football, I guess. So uh, really looking forward to the return of the NFL and uh, playing fantasy football with some friends. But uh, before we get to that, we got some markets to, to chew through and uh, you know some, some discussions and interviews to be had about the markets. On this channel, we often talk about theories, like how is everything going to play out? Today, I've got a guest on or joining me in a few short seconds that'll talk about trading setups and trading strategies and also chart setups really curious because that puts the theory to the test and we can see what the if the theory matches the reality right and uh, it is chris Vermeulen. we've had him on before but it's been a while since he's been on and it's time to chat with him again he's a uh, uh, the chief market strategist over at the technical traders and i'm really looking forward to his insights you guys know the spiel if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet please do so now and uh, let me introduce chris on the screen chris it's good to see you again thank you so much for joining me Ah, thanks for having me back, Guy. Always a pleasure. How do you like summer? I love it. I live on the water. I'm in Canada. Our summer is short, so I like suck in every moment I can. I'm on the dock in the morning. I'm in the dock in the evening for sunset. It's uh, <laughs> I'm the opposite, but it's probably not as hot as Germany. I mean, it's, yeah, uh, you you got it better than me. I'm sitting here in my basement. There's zero airflow, and you could probably see me sweat <laughs> here. It's like it's it's only two weeks of the year, or so that are absolutely miserable. But I got to keep the door closed and and everything, so we can have a nice and quiet conversation. So, it is the the, the dreaded time of the year for me here. Um, <laughs> I'm looking forward to the fall. Are you a football guy? I am not. Uh, I've never really followed big sports. I do the playoffs. I do, you know, all the stuff. It's funny, though. I don't follow sports. In my first year of college, the whole residence had a challenge for football. And you had to pick right up front who was going to beat and who's going to win the most games. And I won out of the entire, like, 2,100 people or something. I won the most picking the most winning teams. And I picked the craziest theory because I don't know football was, like, this sounds terrible. It'd be like, you know, Indians versus um, Cowboys. I'm like, Ugh. I'm like, a Cowboy will shoot an Indian from a lot further away. And then it would be like the one, the ones that were difficult was like the, the Dolphins versus the Eagles. Right. And I was yeah. be like, well, uh, so those were the toss ups. <laughs> it's like <laughs> terrible theory, but it worked. <laughs> uh, so the bears won the Super Bowl, or. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, don't, no. I don't remember. It was a long. It was twenty five years ago. No, that's hilarious. But it's a fun theory though, because there are a lot of animal names, of course, in the NFL. So um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. No. Um, all right. Fun, fun, fun aside. All kidding aside, we got to talk markets, Chris. And uh, maybe as a, as an entry and, and opener here as well. Like, how, how nervous are the markets based on what you've seen over the last ten days here? Uh, the markets are pretty nervous. Um, I mean, there's there's a lot of interesting price action going on. We've seen over the last couple of weeks, we've really seen money flowing out of those magnificent seven. So we've seen the NASDAQ, the SP 500 get hit very hard. And those days where those indexes are down like one, two, two and a half percent, which is big for those major indexes, we would see the Russell 2000 skyrocket like one, two or three percent to the upside. Uh, so there's all kinds of really weird price action going on where money is flowing out of the big blue chip, large cap AI and into the tiny small caps uh, with a vengeance. Uh, we've seen we've we've seen this shift once before, or actually a few times before. We saw it um, just before uh, we went into the 2022 um, bear market phase, um, uh, where everybody moved into small caps. It popped up for about one week, a big rally, just like we saw recently in in the IWM, the small cap sector, and then we started a bear market. We also saw the exact thing happen back in 2008 just before the stock market went off a cliff it went into another bear market so this is kind of people finally rotating the masses starting to rotate out of the big 
news driven stocks where it sucks the most people in with FOMO. And then those people are like getting scared and they're quickly moving into small cap stocks going, Hey, there's tons of opportunity in these small caps. Uh, and usually when people get really bullish and they move into aggressive stocks, it's when they usually get slaughtered. Uh, so we have an interesting setup just from the money flows of where money has been going from the large caps into the small and the micro caps um, over the past uh, really two months or so. So it's kind of a little bit of a warning flag. Absolutely. Yeah, a lot of money being rotated as well. Like a lot of money is also sitting on the sidelines and managed money market funds. They're just collecting 5% uh, annually right now. But uh, with the 10 year dipping below 4% for a while, um, do, do you see that money starting to move already? Uh, I mean, I think money's I don't know. I, I think people are way too sensitive with the Fed. It's like everybody's like waiting for the Fed to just step in and save them on any little, you know, panic selling like we saw earlier uh, last last week. Uh, the market with it had a, a collapse. Uh, overall, I don't know. I think I think it's just kind of mixed. People are way too jumpy, but pe uh, it, it's tough to say. I would say people are right now just kind of trading on pure emotions. They're still front running the Fed. Everybody keeps wanting and betting that the Fed's going to lower rates and that bonds are going to take off and that people are want to get, you know, maybe potentially into the stock market. If rates are going to go down, they, they want to move in. That's obviously what the Fed always tries to do is like cut rates. And that's like a bullet to like fire the stock market back up, because if you're going to make less in a, in a bond or something, you want to move somewhere where there's there's more aggressiveness. But uh, um, we have over the past month and a half, we've had very, very weird money flows. And so subscribers and I, we've been watching it. We watch all the flows between the different asset classes, various sectors from risk on to risk off and precious metals and utilities and currencies. And it's been haywire. And so there isn't a clear answer right now. When the markets go wild, we actually step aside. So we got out of the markets about two and a half, two and a half weeks ago or so, uh, just before it started to collapse because all of our strategy, strategies were saying, hey, something weird is going on. The money flows have stopped piling in and now they're starting to like move out. Uh, so there isn't a clear answer right now. We're letting the markets try to figure out what they want to do. Well, what is the market pricing in right now? It's quite interesting. There are a lot of things pulling on the market. We've had the yen carry trade last week, but also sort of the, uh, the, the Trump trade unwinding is a buzzword I picked up in the news here this, this week as well. Um, but also I'm looking at the, the FedWatch tool here, the CME puts out, and uh, it looks like the market is discounting the price cuts of the, of the Fed or the uh, potential Fed rate cut as well. It used to be 50 basis points. Now the, the market seems to favor 25 basis point cut. What, what is the main influence? right now in the market what makes uh, investors nervous um it's tough i mean i don't i don't pay any attention to the fed like uh, i don't <laughs> i don't really care what the fed does i don't care what the rates do i don't care what the economy is doing because I, I follow price action so i don't i always try and forecast where i think it's going i usually forecast both directions so and i have a game plan for whichever way it goes but I could really care less of what they're doing. In fact, like all, all the noise, like if we were to take a look at the chart of like TLT bonds, this is a good gauge of um, what people are thinking and doing about with the Fed and rates. So bonds have obviously been in a bear market since 2020. They're trying to carve out a bottom right now. And uh, if I was to just zoom into the daily chart, you can see as we started to have a big sell off uh, about a week ago, we saw money starting to pile into the bond market. TLT skyrocketed because people are, first of all, they're scared to be in stocks. So they naturally move to bonds. It's kind of a 40 year, you know, people have done it their entire life. So naturally it's helping lift bonds. But then also everybody was talking about the Fed has to step in with emergency rate cut. This is crazy. They all panicked on that Monday where the markets opened lower, uh, which you and I'll talk about uh, in, in a little bit, I'm sure. Um, but overall, this is just telling us how sensitive this market is. And they're, they instantly think the Fed's going to do something. And then suddenly the, the move gets wiped back, uh, wiped out, and now it's going back up again. So it's really just people are, we all know the rates are going to go down in time, but it's just people are really jumpy and they think the Fed's going to do it right away as soon as there's like a little bit of pain on, on the street. But uh, a one day drop isn't like enough to, for the Fed to do anything, really. I was going to say we got 35 more days of suffer, suffering until we know what the Fed is going to do and uh, Jackson Hole in between as well. But let, let's leave theory aside. Like, I'm really curious, like what, what the stocks are telling you right now. Um, of course, I went to YouTube and, and checked out your recent uh, latest or latest videos as well. And uh, you called the market as doing a bit of a debt cat bounce. And I think we need to sort of explain what that means. A, what is a debt cat bounce and what, what are you implying? 
Yeah, so a dead cat bounce, uh, some people take that uh, a little abrasively, but all, all it is, it's an actual, it's not my term, it's an actual trading term, FYI. <laughs> no cats were have, harmed I, in filming this video, yeah. Exactly, I have gotten some some serious feedback on saying that, but hey, it's it's a technical term, so that's, that's the way it is. So a dead cat bounce is when there is a, this is the SP500, when we have a very strong sell-off and markets drop, um, you naturally, if it drops so far, and there's enough panic and there's enough panic selling and, and all that stuff, it, there's going to be a bounce. And they say a dead cat bounce. I don't know why, just because it, it's going to bounce and then, it, and then it's just going to go lower and continue to sell off. It's usually uh, a fairly bearish sign, meaning lower pricing. Uh, so it's, it's an, it's an overreaction to the downside. And so everybody piles in quickly saying, Hey, this, this is a major low. This is a significant washout. Um, that, you know, I want to buy, buy the dip. And people are in the buy the dip mentality still because it has worked for, for a long time other than in 2022. But um, that's all it is. A dead cat bounce means we have bounced right back up now into resistance area. There's a bunch of moving averages we're trading at now, the 20 day, the 50 day. It's also where the market, just where the market had started the breakdown. Uh, and, and it's just a, a resistance level. So we've had a very strong move up and usually it's going to stall out our short-term indicators have generated a sell signal yesterday at the close. Uh, we have FOMO buying on the New York Stock Exchange, which is telling us the majority of shares yesterday on the New York Stock Exchange were being bought on the ask, meaning they're not like sitting an order out there saying, well, if somebody sells down to me, I'll buy like with a limit order. They're actually just hitting like market button, like get me in, get me in, I want in, it's leaving without me. And so when we see most orders getting bought with like a market order, hitting the ask, driving the markets higher, that is telling us that, okay, everybody's now feeling like they're missing out. Typically, they feel like they miss out like right after when all this sets up where we're at resistance, we've had a huge percentage bounce and um, everything's just stretched, you know, standard deviation wise. I mean, this is a huge move. It's now overbought. And so uh, I think we're going to see this market pull back, which is the whole reason of my last video talking about, you know, this is a dead cat bounce. We could very easily see this market get wiped out, this rally in, in two or three days. And people would be like, what the heck? How did I just buy at the high? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, interesting. Like, did you see a pickup in vol uh, volume there as well? Like, what are some of the indicators you're looking at when you look at those like tra behaviors in the, in the market? And also, like, have some important trend, li trend lines been broken that the market is just ignoring? Yeah, so if we take a look at the chart, the, the NASDAQ is the best example. And this is what I was uh, talking with subscribers about because the NASDAQ has got obviously most of the, the big techs which are driving the market. And so... I like to use a couple different things. So first of all, yes, as you mentioned, there was an increase in volume. We did see a, a week or two before the big drop, uh, we saw elevated volume to the downside. All the volume spikes were red. That's telling us there's distribution selling. So big funds, institutions are starting to unload big blocks of shares to lighten their load. That's never a good sign. Um, and then on top of that, I wanted to make sure, you know, when before this market bounces, we generally want to see a measured move hit. Now, I, I like to use Fibonacci extensions. I find it's the most accurate tool. And this gauge is, I'm just going to draw on the chart here real quick, the momentum of the move. So the momentum of this drop in price and then the strength of the bounce once you have that figured out, and usually you know it's fairly significant when you get a lot of volatility, so price is chopping around, usually you see volume increasing, that's usually like the first sign that, okay, here's a first leg. Now, now we can, once it starts to move lower, we can forecast and predict where this momentum should carry, which is all the way down to this 100% measured move, which is labeled one, and that's where that move should be. And what the market did was it, it opened the next day, way down at this 100% measured move, which tells us it's oversold, it's hit its target, it was complete panic. The VIX, the volatility index, or the fear index, spiked 176%, which is massive. We haven't seen a spike in, in that kind of fear since COVID. Uh, all of those things lining up when the stock market and the Magnificent Seven like all gap down right to support. I was telling everybody, okay, this is like everybody is going is literally going to eject out of their trades at the open and and then the market is going to rally. And that's what we've seen. The stock market has had this massive rally from that open and we're up, you know, nine percent kind of pretty much day after day. 
uh, and it was a pure technical trade. Like this was, this is pretty much as clean as it gets to identify the bottom. Most people sold right at the low at the open. And that was the actual ultimate buying opportunity for a bounce, just a bounce. That is it at this point. You're not, it, it's a counter trend trade. It's something an active trader does. Uh, and I would say it's over now. Anything now is icing on the cake, but uh, that drop in that market definitely shows with the volume and the panic that this is an, an important wave. And I think damage was done to the charts. The VIX hit such a high level. So many people bailed out that I think the momentum has shifted from the upside uh, to the downside. In fact, if, if I was to look at the, um, uh, this is the weekly chart of the SPY and the technicals and sentiment and money flows that we've had in the last uh, two or three weeks here is actually identical to what we saw right over here. We have the exact same type of setup and this is 2022. And this is when we went into this bearish phase where the stock market was lower all year, people panicked. Uh, and so we have that same setup now. And right now, you know, we, we had a bounce and we're having that bounce now and this market could, could end up becoming fairly ugly. And the key to any quality investing and strategy is to know what stage of the market you're in, what the underlying trends are, because you want to make sure that, you know, you're investing with the trend. If the tide is up, you want to own equities. Generally, if the tide is down, you do not want to hold equities. Right now, we are still in a rising tide, but we have all the red indicators that we are like right back into a top. And the big question will be eventually here is, is this just a 2022 bear market and it pulls back for a while? Or are we going to actually like go into a significant drop and, and then eventually collapse? And I think we could we could go back to the 2022 lows and even worse. I mean, there's people with predictions much more bearish than that. Uh, it really depends on how things unfold. But I do feel like we're going we're just about to start a new bear market. The question is, is it a contained bear market like 2022? Or is it like a full on stage four market collapse like 2008 financial crisis or the, the tech bubble burst? Um, those are both stage four declines. Those are financial resets. It affects almost all assets, including like real estate and precious metals and um, all of those things. So it's definitely something to be aware of and at least be ready for if it happens. I can't hear you, Kai. I was coughing. I muted myself. I do apologize. Oh. Um, Nick, one, one thing I need to follow up with you: you brought up the VIX a couple times, and it is an index I still have a hard time wrapping my head around. Could you, could you do myself and maybe our audience a bit of a favor? Explain what the VIX is, how it is measured, and to, exactly that. Like, how did it? Like, what was the impact here? Like, it is a significant move in there. Yeah. So the VIX. I mean, I'm not a I'm not a master on the VIX. I it's tied into options uh, on the, in the futures and, and the SP 500, the, depending on what, there's a bunch of different volatility, VIX indexes, depending on which index you want to change, follow. But you can see here, 2020, we had a huge spike in the VIX up to, you know, 85 or so. Uh, if we were to just go back in time, so you can get a gauge of what happened back in uh, 2009, we went up into this 90, 95 area. Uh, so the spike that we had recently went up to 65. It's a pretty good wave of fear. But overall, um, you know, it's, it's just usually it's like a tide is changing. So um, I think the upward momentum in the equities market, this is a strong enough bout of fear that I think that the tide is changing. And it's just telling us how much people are panicking in the markets and uh, typically a big spike in the VIX. They say when the VIX is high, it's time to buy, uh, meaning if the VIX is high, the market has crashed, everybody has sold everything. And that's, you know, when you can pick up things at a discount now just because we have a spike now and i believe we're like at a market top doesn't mean it's a long-term buying opportunity the vix can actually now trade sideways or stay elevated and even move lower for a long time as the stock market continues to move lower it, it doesn't it's not as easy as when the vix is high it's time to buy and that's like a something people get sucked into uh, but overall you this is just telling us how scared the general public is uh, on more or less the SP 500 and, and their positions. And, um, you know, a, a low VIX means there's not much fear in the market. Uh, right now we're seeing high VIX and we're seeing a high put call ratio, which people are, not only did people bail out and sell all their positions on that big crash on Black Monday or whatever, the, you know, people want to call it, uh, but they started to buy put options at a rate that they're buying more puts, which are leveraged plays, contracts on the market, betting it's going lower. 
So not only did they sell their positions, but then they're like, I'm going to bet that this market's going to keep crashing. And that's like a signature, like, okay, the market's going to have a huge bounce because now everybody's doing the same thing and they're all betting on falling pricing at the same time. And of course, the market has a great way of catching the majority off guard, which is that huge rally, which, you know, we watched unfold tick by tick. And I mean, people just have gotten absolutely slaughtered on this sharp bounce because they all turn bearish literally right at the bottom. Uh, and the VIX is one of these indicators. It just tells us how panicky the masses are. We were talking about that we're in the heights of the middle of summer right now, Chris. And uh, like, how much does seasonality play into all of this? Like maybe less volume, you know, people are not really paying attention. How, how much is that being abu used and abused? Yeah, so generally the stock market tops out somewhere between June and August. We usually see the market kind of stall out in there and then it'll eventually sell off into October. Uh, last year, the stock market followed this pretty much to the T. It rallied through January, topped out June, July, sold off. It put a low in the last week of October and then screamed higher into the end of the year. I think this year is a little bit different. The market does not always move like that. Uh, but we're here, right? If you look down the bottom, August, and we're having this sharp bounce and rally in August right now. So there's still a little bit more potential upside or the market might hold its value. Uh, but overall, it's saying that in the next week or so, this market seasonality wise, on average over the last 30 years is about to, to roll over in sell off. And um, and then we'll have to see what happens after this sell off. If we get a huge rally to new highs, which I highly doubt, but you never know. Um, mm -hmm. Or if after this sell off, we actually have a cycle break. And then instead of going higher, it actually extends to the downside and picks up even more speed and it becomes like, you know, a major trend reversal and we start to see a stage four decline hit, um, you know, next year. And uh, which is a big opportunity if, if you're primed and ready for it. You, you mentioned money flows earlier, and I thought it was an interesting topic maybe to dive a little deeper on. And uh, I'm curious if you've seen like volume notifications in any of them, any, any market actually, because I'm curious, like, where's the, where is the money going? Like uh, the Yen carry trade, for example, meant a lot of people were borrowing money in Japan, bringing it over and maybe putting it in NVIDIA. 10 times leveraged or so to, to, to make their money, but that money has to go somewhere, right? So I'm curious, like where, where could it be flowing? You mentioned earlier it was haywire, but uh, did you pick up any signals, like any market that you didn't maybe have on your radar screen that you found just like, oh, that's interesting. That's uh, maybe where it's going. Move higher. When we take a look over at gold here, uh, gold has had a very strong chart pattern. It points to much higher pricing. We've seen it rally up, consolidate. It's rallied, it's consolidated. Uh, and of course, it, it's on its way higher. There hasn't been anything that has really caught us off guard in terms of um, something coming to life and really taking off. Uh, Bitcoin was looking primed and ready to break out. Um, but once we had that panic selling, it, it pulled it right back down, which just goes to show that Bitcoin and cryptos are now like really tied into the stock market and the NASDAQ. If there's big selling in the NASDAQ, Bitcoin tends to, to sell off with it. Um, but I like I like gold. Gold still looks like it's it's heading higher. It's super conservative out of all the plays right now. And I've been saying this for the last like month and a half is the best highest probability play is just gold, physical gold like GLD or buying physical gold versus miners or silver or silver miners simply because gold has low volatility. You can put your money in it. You're not going to wake up down 15 percent. Um, it's it's seasonality wise, you know, it's it's going in, it's going to go into a strong phase here. We're in, in in a market condition where gold generally does very well. In fact, if we were to take a look at um, the the cycles of the market, uh, we tend to see gold do very, very well just before a stock market top. Energy stocks have been trading near all time highs and industrial capital goods have been trading near all time highs. All, all of these are telling us a few different things. Precious metals tells us the masses around the world are getting nervous of some type of recession or reset. Energy stocks, we're just really seeing, you know, uh, people continue to spend money and people are forecasting strong economy. And that's generally not, uh, usually that happens when everybody's bullish on energy and they're, the economy, usually the economy is about to stall out. And so same with capital, uh, industrial capital goods, everybody's upgrading their factories or assembly lines. They've had stellar couple years of sales. So they they're planning for more growth. And when everybody's like super bullish and buying and upgrading their facilities, 
they tend to do it right at the worst possible time when we go into a, a recession and they'll wish they'll have their old assembly plants that were lines that were already paid for and didn't have like millions in debt. Uh, so when everybody's really bullish, this is like one of the, these are three different types of sentiment indicators that are telling us we are close to a major market top and gold is like my favorite play because the whole world slowly accumulates it. It doesn't move fast. So it doesn't have people panicking out of it, like in miners and silver where they get move 15, 20%, like, you know, in a, in a clip. Tell me so, about it. <laughs> yeah. So all these things are coming together. Nothing has popped out of the norm uh, for, for what we're, we're seeing at this point. It's just things are unfolding as we anticipated. We're seeing like non-farm payrolls, unemployment start to rise, which is this yellow cycle. This is the economic cycle. So we're definitely like in these topping phases where the stock market is slowing. All the signs are there. Uh, the economy is slowing. It hasn't quite turned a corner yet in the United States. I mean, there's recessions in a lot of different countries, but it's coming. So uh, it's going to be pretty interesting to see unfold, uh, you know, month after month. We inch our way there, I think. Yeah, in interesting. Like, and since you brought up on gold, like I'm, I'm going to stay on that topic because I do have a question for you specific to August 5th as well. Uh, if you could pull up that chart, it'd be phenomenal. Um, sure. I'm curious, like I want to talk to you about the, the behavior of gold on uh, on the Black Monday. Uh, we can still define a term for it because I don't think it was that bad. But uh, uh, I'm curious because gold also traded down that day. And uh, you, you mentioned something interesting earlier in our conversation that uh, once that financial reset happens, everything will be sold off. And I um, just wanted to ask you, like, did that uh, the gold chart on that Monday, August 5th, sort of reflect what you've been saying? Is that a, like what you call it? Is that the perfect case study for what you mentioned earlier? Uh, yeah, more or less. So the, the problem when there's panic in the, in the market, like in a stage four major market reset, there's usually enough fear. If there's enough fear in the market, almost everything sells off. It's, people just literally sell everything. They're just like, they don't know what to do. When, you're, when people are scared, they say no. They say, get me out. It's just like natural reaction. And so when there's super high levels of fear, which we saw on that Monday, uh, it pulled gold down. But when you look at it overall, this I, I highlighted with this blue bar, that's the day gold pulled back just a little bit. I mean, it was a pretty big day for gold, but in the grand scheme of things, it's not enough to shake your core and shake you out of a trade. And it slowed down, you know, over the next two days, and then it's right back up to those highs. So that's why gold is so nice that it, even when the worst case hits, it, it can hold its value really, really well. Um, but my case is if we go into a bear market, I do believe gold, silver, and miners will pull back with them. I think gold could rally to 2650 to 2750. That's what the charts, the short term and long term charts are pointing to. Uh, if we go into a stage four and a big market correction later this year or next year, whenever it happens, gold will probably get pulled back all the way back to where it is right now, maybe even back down to 2000. Who knows? Um, so it will get hit. And we've seen this before. The monthly chart of gold is a perfect example and, and shows you exactly kind of where we are in terms of these kind of super super cycles at play, which is we started a new precious metal super cycle in 2019. We also started one back here in early 2000. Eventually it built up and got strong. We saw gold consolidate, have a multi-year pause. Well, we've got this multi-year pause right now. It's been consolidating. And then back in 2007, 2008, gold started to run. And that's because the world sees things slowing. They're becoming nervous. Smart money is moving into a defensive, slower moving asset to protect themselves. And that's exactly what we're seeing right now. And then, of course, when we hit a bear market, uh, a financial reset, there's enough panic that margin calls, all kinds of things happen where gold pulled back and eventually we'll see gold pull back. And then we're into this. What I is what, what I'm waiting for it. Everyone else in the precious metal space is that next multi year run where gold hits like you know, 3,000, 5,000, wherever it goes, silver back at 50, 80, 100, wherever. Miners go ballistic, like life-changing, you know, bull market phase. Now, we're not there yet. Uh, we still have a bit of a roller coaster ride to go through, but this is how it it's most likely to unfold. And that's just kind of what I'm waiting for. I hold a lot of physical. I have zero miners. Um, I won't be looking for miners until we start into this, until we've had a market correction. And then, then we'll you know, be in this exciting phase. So that's where we are. Obviously, miners and silver will get hit much harder. Silver was down like 65%. Miners were down even more than that. Um, 
So it really just, you pick your, your risk tolerance, uh, but it's all about timing. The market still is, you need to identify the start of a new trend, make sure the stars have aligned for that particular asset, which is where this kind of circle is, which um, I'm hoping is next year at some point. And then of course you're off to the races with, um, with that kind of uh, opportunity. Yeah, interesting. Like you, you touched on silver, so I'm not going to ask a follow up question on it, but maybe we can pull up the chart because it is way more volatile than gold, obviously, as well um, in, in behavior. And it has been weaker than gold uh, in, in recent days and weeks here as well. Um, sort of a bit of a divergence again from gold, not holding up as well. Is that something similar that you're seeing as well? What, what do you make of that? Yeah, so it, it's very similar. It's just more volatile. But I mean, we had we had silver, you know, break into a, a new bull market. It went con it consolidated for a few years and it rallied up just before the the last stage four, you know, recession uh, that we had. Uh, we've had we've had a new bull, bull bull market in it. It's been consolidating in a much larger pattern. It's starting to run up a bit and uh, we'll see. I still think we're going to see silver potentially run up to thirty four, thirty six. Um, and, and gold's going to go to 2650, 2750. So I still think there's another leg up here, but then we're going to go into some market correction and we'll probably see silver back down in the mid or low twenties, just like we saw back in 2008. And that's when that, you know, that's when gold I think can go parabolic and really start to take off and, and hit new all time highs. So it's, it's a, it's a different looking chart, but still very similar. They tend generally move together. It's just silver's a lot more volatile and is always a bit messier of a chart. Interesting. No, I appreciate that, uh, Chris. A um, couple last questions here. And like you mentioned sort of end game scenarios, or I, I phrased it end game scenario, but uh, just to sort of summarize what you've mentioned, but uh, in an end game scenario, where, where should we hide, Chris? Like, where, where would you park your money? I mean, we, we move to the sidelines. Um, if I was to just to show you in the most boring asset class you can pretty much do, which is, let me just go to the daily chart. This is, it's Bill. B-I-L is the symbol. It is just a one to three month treasury bill. There's like no downside, pretty much doesn't matter where you buy it. Uh, every day it adds interest to your money. If you hold it past the end of the month, it pays out all of that interest as a dividend, which is taxed at a lower tax bracket. So you literally just sit sideways, just getting a, a monthly dividend payment while the stock market collapses and falls apart. And so this is this is where we navigated to a couple of weeks ago before the market sold off. So, you know, we're watching our accounts just inch our way higher while everyone else is panicking and and uh, the markets have no clear direction right now. The market could go either way. We have to wait for a new uptrend to start and then we'll get long or wait for a breakdown and, and take oppor an opportunity to profit from falling pricing. But right now it's like, this is pretty much an, a cash position and we don't have to worry about it. It's not like TLT where the bond price is gonna fall. It's literally just cash and interest or dividend payments and is a very comfortable spot to be sitting, especially like in the summer. We got kids back to school soon. It's nice to have no positions on and spend the summer with the kids and play and all that stuff. So it's really the perfect time for, for this trade, in my opinion. Yeah, it makes, makes for some good sleep. Absolutely. Yeah. And just to confirm, you're 100% in that right now, in the BIL? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, can you, can you repeat that? You cut out, of course, right at, when you answered. Yeah, we're 100% in BIL right now. Okay, no, fantastic. Um, I have one very last question because it's an interesting topic because I've been bombarded on Instagram Reels and the AI has picked up that I have a certain interest in real estate right now. Um, just, just looking at some of the land in the US and uh, housing to a degree as well. Um, what do you make of the real estate market? And we talked about the Fed potentially cutting rates. Um, I'm being bombarded with also Reels that announced like a lot of price cuts in the markets, you know, a lot of uh, inventory hitting the market. So I'm curious, what do you make of the real estate market? And is that a place where you would invest? And do you expect price spikes once the Fed is uh, cutting? Yeah, so that's a good question. I mean, if we can look at an ETF, uh, IYR, it's a real estate uh, a REIT ETF. And so we've actually been seeing this is actually a top performer on our hot list for the one of the hottest sectors. It continues to move higher while the stock market goes lower. And this is one of those other little indicators that says, hey, okay, Everybody's dumping their stocks yet and they don't know where to go and they're either buying gold like they're, they're naturally going to physical things They're like put me in something physical like gold get me out of stocks or they go to like real estate. And so a lot of people will move to a real estate ETF, which is what we're seeing here is where we've been seeing this ETF push higher because people are like, I don't know what to do. Just put me in something that I know is consistent, which is real estate. And so we have been seeing this perform. Uh, really, really well. 
Now, the, the big misbelief here is when we get into, you technically don't really own like the real estate ETF. It's not like um, a house in terms of this ETF can drop huge. For example, if we were to just take a look at the 2022 uh, market, we saw more or less real estate fell about 40% this ETF. Now, most home prices didn't fall 40%, but these ETFs, because they're the share price is driven by investors, fear and greed, uh, it will over move, make these moves over extended and a lot bigger. And of course, you go way back in time. I mean, we saw the real estate ETF uh, fall 75 or plus percent back in the last crash. So in the grand scheme of things, it's not a very safe play. It is safe right now. It's the kind of people are migrating over there to try to side skirt the, the selling. But in the grand scheme of things, if you look where we are, we've had a move down. The market is consolidating, which is a bearish pattern. Uh, we had the same back in 2008, market moved down, it consolidated for about a year or so, and then it went into a stage four decline. And so this, you know, this sideways pause, uh, Kai, is really just the halfway point. So there's, you know, we could be right back down to these COVID lows, no problem with real estate ETF. So it's holding up well now, but when there's blood in the streets, I, I'm, this is why you need to get out of the equities markets, every type of equity, when the market goes down, there will be maybe the occasional sector that goes up or the occasional stock, but out of like thousands and thousands of them, it's not worth trying to pick that one and hope it, it bucks the trend. You're better to profit from falling pricing by playing an inverse ETF or moving to a different asset that could go up like the US dollar index potentially or gold. Uh, we'll have to just see, but real estate is gonna get hit very hard. I think the real estate market is, I think you were mentioning off camera there, you get all kinds of interest and people offering real estate. And I'm seeing the exact same thing. I actually have just done some recent uh, real estate podcasts and everybody is super bullish again. And usually everybody gets bullish like just before it goes off a cliff again. And I, that's what I feel is going on. They all think, yeah, they all think that the next leg up in real estate's coming. I don't think it's anywhere near. I think we got many years. Uh, it's, of I'm getting contradicting signals, quite honestly. Also, like from my Instagram feed, but oh. quite honestly, I should be relying on it. But it's an interesting indicator because one thing I've been hearing as well, a lot of Airbnb properties are hitting the market. So people right. are getting out of their Airbnb rental units that are not producing as much anymore or usually produced at a very narrow margin and uh, they're selling them maybe even at mm -hmm. a loss. I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, um, that's something I've been picking up. So just just that buzzword is the Airbnb inventory is something I'm I'm paying attention to as well. So yeah, really, really interesting. interesting. Chris, where, where can we follow your work? That was a phenomenal conversation. I really appreciated your you appreciate your time, of course. How can we follow your work? How can we reach you? Yeah, you can uh, follow me at the technical traders.com or follow follow some of my videos on YouTube at uh, the technical traders at YouTube. And uh, I share I share my charts and screens every morning with subscribers. You copy the trades that I do. I built my strategy for my money. So every trade that goes on is what I'm doing. So you're really just riding my coattails and I'm riding the coattails of the markets and uh, we can all benefit and learn from it and stay mentally prepared for all the moves that come and uh, things don't catch us off guard. So that's the that's the key is being disciplined and having a strategy and not getting emotional and having a plan to, to take action. 100%. No, Chris, really appreciate it. Super informative conversation. Always like putting some uh, reality around our theories here on the channel. And uh, your time is much appreciated. Thanks so much for sharing uh, your, your wisdom and your insights. And uh, everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. I really like talking charts from time to time as well. I'm not a technical trader at all. Like charts don't really tell me that much. Of course, I can read a price from it and directions are obviously clear. But uh, I don't know. I don't get the intricacies. So that's why we invite experts to the channel. If you like this conversation, please hit a like, hit the subscribe button, leave a comment. What do you see is happening? I'm curious what your thoughts are on real estate. What do you see happening uh, in the market? Uh, Airbnb is an interesting one for me. That's something I've been following and I've been mentioning a few times here on the channel because I've been watching a lot of finance influencers talking about very slow or slim margins on their Air Airbnb rental properties. And now I think it's time we're due to hit the fan and they're trying to get off of those properties. And I'm curious uh, how that is being reflected in the market. I'm, I'm out of words. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's time to end it here. It's way too warm down here in my home studio and uh, we'll be back with lots more this week. Thank you so much for tuning in.